Section 16 of Old Greek Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Gonzalez. Old Greek Stories by James Baldwin. Section 16 The Cruel Tribute. 1. The Treaty minos king of crete had made war upon athens he had come with a great fleet of ships and an army and had burned the merchant vessels in the harbor and had overrun all the country and the coast even to megara which lies to the west he had laid waste the fields and gardens round about athens had pitched his camp close to the walls and had sent word to the athenian rulers that on the morrow he would march into their city with fire and sword and would slay all their young men and would pull down all their houses even to the temple of athena which stood on the great hill above the town then aegeus the king of athens with twelve elders who were his helpers went out to see king minos and to treat with him o mighty king they said what have we done that you should wish thus to destroy us from the earth o cowardly and shameless men answered king minos why do you ask this foolish question since you can but know the cause of my wrath i had an only son androgios by name and he was dearer to me than the hundred cities of crete and the thousand islands of the sea over which i rule three years ago he came hither to take part in the games which you held in honor of athena whose temple you have built on yonder hilltop you know how he overcame all your young men in the sports and how the people honored him with song and dance and laurel crown but when your king this same aegeus who stands before me now saw how everybody ran after him and praised his valor he was filled with envy and laid plans to kill him whether he caused armed men to waylay him on the road to thebes or whether as some say he sent him against a certain wild bull of your country to be slain by that beast i know not but you cannot deny that this young man's life was taken from him through the plotting of this aegeus but we do deny it we do deny it cried the elders for at that very time our king was sojourning at troison on the other side of the saronic sea and he knew nothing of the young prince's death we ourselves managed the city's affairs while he was abroad and we know whereof we speak androgios was slain not through the king's orders but by the king's nephews who hoped to rouse your anger against aegeus so that you would drive him from athens and leave the kingdom to one of them will you swear that what you tell me is true said minos we will swear it they said now then said minos you shall hear my decree athens has robbed me of my dearest treasure a treasure that can never be restored to me so in return i require from athens as tribute that possession which is the dearest and most precious to her people and it shall be destroyed cruelly as my son was destroyed the condition is hard said the elders but it is just what is the tribute which you require has the king a son asked minos the face of king aegeus lost all its color and he trembled as he thought of a little child then with its mother at troison on the other side of the saronic sea but the elders knew nothing about that child and they answered alas no he has no son but he has fifty nephews who are eating up his substance and longing for the time to come when one of them shall be king and as we have said it was they who slew the young prince androgios i have naught to do with those fellows said minos you may deal with them as you like but you ask what is the tribute that i require and i will tell you every year when the springtime comes and the roses begin to bloom you shall choose seven of your noblest youths and seven of your fairest maidens and shall send them to me in a ship which your king shall provide this is the tribute which you shall pay to me minos king of crete and if you fail for a single time or delay even a day my soldiers shall tear down your walls and burn your city 
and put your men to the sword and sell your wives and children as slaves we agree to all this o king said the elders for it is the least of two evils but tell us now what shall be the fate of the seven youths and the seven maidens in crete answered minos there is a house called the labyrinth the like of which you have never seen in it there are a thousand chambers and winding ways and whosoever goes even a little way into them can never find his way out again into this house the seven youths and the seven maidens shall be thrust and they shall be left there to perish with hunger cried the elders to be devoured by a monster whom men call the minotaur said minos then king aegeus and the elders covered their faces and wept and went slowly back into the city to tell their people of the sad and terrible conditions upon which athens could alone be saved it is better that a few should perish than that the whole city should be destroyed they said two the tribute years passed by every spring when the roses began to bloom seven youths and seven maidens were put on board of a black-sailed ship and sent to crete to pay the tribute which king minos required in every house in athens there was sorrow and dread and the people lifted up their hands to athena on the hilltop and cried out how long o queen of the air how long shall this thing be in the meanwhile the little child at troison on the other side of the sea had grown to be a man his name theseus was in everybody's mouth for he had done great deeds of daring and at last he had come to athens to find his father king aegeus who had never heard whether he was alive or dead and when the youth had made himself known the king had welcomed him to his home and all the people were glad because so noble a prince had come to dwell among them and in time to rule over their city the springtime came again the black-sailed ship was rigged for another voyage the rude cretan soldiers paraded the streets and the herald of king minos stood at the gates and shouted yet three days o athenians and your tribute will be due and must be paid then in every street the doors of the houses were shut and no man went in or out but every one sat silent with pale cheeks and wondered whose lot it would be to be chosen this year but the young prince theseus did not understand for he had not been told about the tribute what is the meaning of all this he cried what right has a cretan to demand tribute in athens and what is this tribute of which he speaks then aegeus led him aside and with tears told him the sad war with king minos and of the dreadful terms of peace now say no more sobbed aegeus it is better that a few should die even thus than that all should be destroyed but i will say more cried theseus athens shall not pay tribute to crete i myself will go with these youths and maidens and i will slay the monster minotaur and defy king minos himself upon his throne oh do not be so rash said the king for no one who is thrust into the den of the minotaur ever comes out again remember that you are the hope of athens and do not take this great risk upon yourself say you that i am the hope of athens said theseus then how can i do otherwise than go and he began at once to make himself ready on the third day all the youths and maidens of the city were brought together in the market-place so that lots might be cast for those who were to be taken then two vessels of brass were brought and set before king aegeus and the herald who had come from crete into one vessel they placed as many balls as there were noble youths in the city and into the other as many as there were maidens and all the balls were white save only seven in each vessel and those were black as ebony then every maiden without looking reached her hand into one of the vessels and drew forth a ball and those who took the black balls were borne away to the black ship which lay in waiting by the shore the young men also drew lots in like manner but when six black balls had been drawn 
Theseus came quickly forward and said, Hold, let no more balls be drawn. I will be the seventh youth to pay this tribute. Now let us go aboard the black ship and be off. Then the people and King Aegeus himself went down to the shore to take leave of the young men and maidens, whom they had no hope of seeing again. And all but Theseus wept and were broken-hearted. I will come again, father, he said. I will hope that you may, said the old king. If when this ship returns I see a white sail spread above the black one, then I shall know that you are alive and well. But if I see only the black one, it will tell me that you have perished. And now the vessel was loosed from its moorings, the north wind filled the sail, and the seven youths and seven maidens were borne away over the sea, towards the dreadful death which awaited them in far distant Crete. 3. THE PRINCESS At last the black ship reached the end of its voyage. The young people were set ashore, and a party of soldiers led them through the streets towards the prison, where they were to stay until the morrow. They did not weep nor cry out now, for they had outgrown their fears. But with paler faces and firm-set lips, they walked between the rows of Cretan houses, and looked neither to the right nor to the left. The windows and doors were full of people who were eager to see them. What a pity such brave young men should be food for the Minotaur, said some. Ah, that maidens so beautiful should meet a fate so sad, said others. And now they passed close by the palace gate, and in it stood King Minos himself and his daughter Ariadne, the fairest of the women of Crete. Indeed, those are noble young fellows, said the king. Yes, too noble to feed the vile Minotaur, said Ariadne. The nobler the better, said the king, and yet none of them can compare with your lost brother Androgios. Ariadne said no more, and yet she thought that she had never seen any one who looked so much like a hero as young Theseus. How tall he was, and how handsome! How proud his eye, and how firm his step! Surely there had never been his like in Crete. All through that night Ariadne lay awake and thought of the matchless hero, and grieved that he should be doomed to perish, and then she began to lay plans for setting him free. At the earliest peep of day she arose, and while everybody else was asleep, she ran out of the palace and hurried to the prison. As she was the king's daughter, the jailer opened the door at her bidding and allowed her to go in. There sat the seven youths and the seven maidens on the ground, but they had not lost hope. She took Theseus aside and whispered to him. She told him of a plan which she had made to save him, and Theseus promised her that when he had slain the Minotaur, he would carry her away with him to Athens, where she should live with him always. Then she gave him a sharp sword and hid it underneath his cloak telling him that with it alone could he hope to slay the minotaur and here is a ball of silken thread she said as soon as you go into the labyrinth where the monster is kept fasten one end of the thread to the stone doorpost and then unwind it as you go along when you have slain the minotaur you have only to follow the thread and it will lead you back to the door in the meanwhile i will see that your ship is ready to sail and then I will wait for you at the door of the labyrinth. Theseus thanked the beautiful princess, and promised her again that if he should live to go back to Athens, she should go with him and be his wife. Then with a prayer to Athena, Ariadne hastened away. 4. THE LABYRINTH As soon as the sun was up, the guards came to lead the young prisoners to the labyrinth. They did not see the sword which Theseus had under his cloak, nor the tiny ball of silk which he held in his closed hand. They led the youths and maidens a long way into the labyrinth, turning here and there, back and forth, a thousand different times, until it seemed certain that they could never find their way out again. Then the guards, by a secret passage, which they alone knew, went out and left them, as they had left many others before, to wander about until they should be found by the terrible Minotaur. Stay close by me, said Theseus to his companions, 
and with the help of Athena, who dwells in her temple home, in our own fair city, I will save you. Then he drew his sword, and stood in the narrow way before them, and they all lifted up their hands and prayed to Athena. For hours they stood there, hearing no sound, and seeing nothing but the smooth high walls on either side of the passage, and the calm blue sky so high above them. Then the maidens sat down upon the ground, and covered their faces, and sobbed, and said, Oh, that he would come and put an end to our misery and our lives! At last, late in the day, they heard a bellowing, low and faint as though far away. They listened, and soon heard it again, a little louder and very fierce and dreadful. It is he, it is he, cried Theseus, and now for the fight! Then he shouted, so loudly that the walls of the labyrinth answered back, and the sound was carried upward to the sky, and outward to the rocks and cliffs of the mountains. The Minotaur heard him, and his bellowings grew louder and fiercer every moment. He is coming, cried Theseus, and he ran forward to meet the beast. The seven maidens shrieked, but tried to stand up bravely and face their fate, and the six young men stood together with firm set teeth and clinched fists, ready to fight to the last. Soon the Minotaur came into view, rushing down the passage towards Theseus, and roaring most terribly. He was twice as tall as a man, and his head was like that of a bull, with huge sharp horns and fiery eyes, and a mouth as large as a lion's. But the young men could not see the lower part of his body, for the cloud of dust which he raised in running. When he saw Theseus, with the sword in his hand, coming to meet him, he paused, for no one had ever faced him in that way before. Then he put his head down, and rushed forward, bellowing. But Theseus leaped quickly aside, and made a sharp thrust with his sword as he passed, and hewed off one of the monster's legs above the knee. The Minotaur fell upon the ground, roaring and groaning and beating wildly about with his horned head and his hoof-like fists, but Theseus nimbly ran up to him and thrust the sword into his heart, and was away again before the beast could harm him. A great stream of blood gushed from the wound, and soon the Minotaur turned his face towards the sky and was dead. Then the youths and maidens ran to Theseus, and kissed his hands and feet, and thanked him for his great deed, and as it was already growing dark, Theseus bade them follow him, while he wound up the silken thread, which was to lead them out of the labyrinth. Through a thousand rooms and courts and winding ways they went, and at midnight they came to the outer door, and saw the city lying in the moonlight before them. And only a little way off was the seashore where the black ship was moored which had brought them to Crete. The door was wide open, and beside it stood Ariadne, waiting for them. The wind is fair, the sea is smooth, and the sailors are ready, she whispered. And she took the arm of Theseus, and all went together through the silent streets to the ship. When the morning dawned, they were far out to sea, and looking back from the deck of the little vessel, only the white tops of the Cretan mountains were in sight. Minos, when he arose from sleep, did not know that the youths and maidens had gotten safe out of the labyrinth, but when Ariadne could not be found, he thought that robbers had carried her away. He sent soldiers out to search for her among the hills and mountains, never dreaming that she was now well on the way towards distant Athens. Many days passed, and at last, the searchers returned, and said that the princess could nowhere be found. Then the king covered his head and wept, and said, Now indeed I am bereft of all my treasures. In the meanwhile, King Aegeus of Athens had sat day after day on a rock by the shore, looking and watching if by chance he might see a ship coming from the south. At last the vessel with Theseus and his companions hove in sight but it still carried only the black sail, for in their joy the young men had forgotten to raise the white one. Alas, alas, my son has perished, moaned Aegeus, and he fainted 
and fell forward into the sea and was drowned and that sea from then until now has been called by his name the aegean sea thus theseus became king of athens end of section 16 recording by bob gonzales end of old greek stories by james baldwin